Hello there. I want to talk about recording and mixing drums. Recording and mixing snare drums especially. But you know what? It's not going to be me who's talking today. It's going to be this guy. This is Mr. Adam Nolly Get Good. You might know him as the bass player in Periphery or as the man behind Get Good Drums or simply as a great metal producer who is known for getting fantastic drum sounds. I have teamed up with Nolly because we wanted to bring you what I would call the most sophisticated, holistic, in-depth drum recording and processing course ever. Nolly and me went to Leeds to a studio called The Nave to film an entire drum recording session. And Nolly talks about drum shells, about cymbals, about the room, about microphones, about drum heads, about tuning, about microphone placement, everything else, about all the puzzle pieces that, if you put them together correctly, become a great drum sound. But he also takes those drum tracks home and mixes the drum for you so you can follow every step of the production. And the course includes the multi-track so you can mix the drums yourself. We turned this into what I think is a metal drum recording and processing lexicon. All right, enough talk maybe. Time to watch some, some, some parts of the course. Let me just tell you that there's a link below to the course, but you can also become a Cola Audio Cult member, which includes the Nolly course and includes all other courses, which is a little smarter. In this video, uh, I think we've got something like 50 minutes of snare content only in this course. And I want to show you some parts of the snare content, not everything, but some parts of it, so you can understand how cool this course is. Have fun with the Nolly drum experience. Snare drum has to be one of the most important things that we're recording when we're recording the drums. And it's for a few reasons. One, the sound of a snare drum often really characterizes not only this, like the drum sound, but the, the sound of the whole mix, like whole albums are defined by the sound of the snare drum when it's really good or really bad. It can so alter the, the feeling of energy in a, in a song, the character of the backbeat, how responsive it is to the drummers playing. Um, and you know, whether it's got like a kind of high, very energetic sound or something that's low and beefy, but also just from a practical perspective, the snare drum is by far the loudest instrument that we're recording in the drum kit. So it's, the thing that we're gonna hear in all of the microphones really loudly. And we wanna make sure that it's sounding good in all of those microphones, because even if we come to sample replacing, if for whatever reason you're sent something to mix that doesn't have a good sounding snare, or you make a decision that you regret later in how you capture the snare, it's still gonna be really loud in the overheads and in the room mics. And if possible, it's good to not have to try and find ways to minimize that because after the fact, that's something that can get quite tricky and you'll eliminate a lot of the, the beautiful, real aspects of what you captured in the studio. So when it comes to recording metal, a lot of the time, drummers and producers will reach for metal drums. Typically brass or bronze is one of the most commonly encountered metals that you find. I'm holding in my lap here a replica of a Tama bell bronze snare. Now this is an incredibly famous kind of drum. It's made out of thick cast bronze. It's got bronze hoops on it as well. This is a replica made by a manufacturer called Cusworth Drums. He's studied the bell brass snares that were made by Tama back in the 80s and 90s and were used on records like Nirvana's Nevermind and Metallica's Black Album. They're pretty much known for being among the loudest but still kind of musical and responsive sounding drums out there. In metal, it's really nice to be able to use a dense metal shell drum like this, which you'll find that that frequency response, the kind of feeling of how much it kicks you in the, in the gut, how much you feel it in your chest, stays really consistent throughout the tuning range, especially on something like a bell bronze. And that's why it's such a kind of famous recording snare to use because you can, you can tune it high and it almost sounds like you're combining the best attributes of a low tuned snare and a high one because it's still got so much body to it. The depth of a snare drum, just like with the toms, the depth kind of changes the relationship with the top and the bottom head. Um, you'll typically find that shallower drums 
actually tend to sound a little bit shorter in the sustain, which is different to the toms. Deeper drums tend to allow the top head to move for a lot longer on its own, which is really starting to talk about the major difference between a snare drum and a tom, which is that on a snare drum, the bottom head is essentially muffled by these snare wires. The snare wires are being held quite tightly across the bottom head, and that's preventing the bottom head from moving in the way that it does on a tom. So the bottom head on a snare drum is really acting as the thing that moves the wires, as well as kind of reflecting back the sound pressure that you're putting in from the top head. So unlike a tom, the pitch that you hear from a snare drum is pretty much just the pitch that you tune the batter head to. I'm not saying that the bottom head doesn't affect the sound or the amount of low end within the snare sound, but really we're just hearing the fundamental tone, like, it's easy to get confused, there's quite a few overtones there, but that, uh, that's the fundamental tone of this drum, as I would say it, and that's really just the pitch of this head. Like if I took the bottom head off this drum and tapped it, you'd still hear a very similar overtone set and note. And that's why with the deeper drums, the bottom head is, being, is influencing the top head less, so you actually just hear the top head ringing on for longer. So shallower drums tend to be less ringy, but they also tend to have a little bit less in terms of low end weight. Here for the session, we've started with Jake's personal snare, which is a Tama John Tempesta signature snare. It's made out of brass. So we've sound checked with the snare drum. It's sounding really good. It sounds kind of like I'd hope a snare drum would sound for any kind of rock and metal session. Brass is a very common material to use for music in rock and metal. You've got famous drums like the Ludwig Black Beauty, which has been created from the early 1900s. Um, they're made out of brass and brass tends to be characterized by having a nice warmth to it, a nice body. And while it has a lot of overtone, it's not the really high frequency kind of zingy overtones. They tend to be lower in the frequency range and they just sound more pleasant on the ear. I'm using uh, these Evans dry heads. This one's an HD dry, this one's an ST dry, um, the slightly different thicknesses of the plies. So what the dry aspect in the head refers to is the fact that it's got these little holes drilled around the perimeter. Those are gonna allow the air to come out of the drum so it kind of doesn't ring for quite as long. So it's gonna control the sustain, but we're not gonna to need to add moon gel unless we really want a dry sound. And that's gonna keep some life into the overtones of the drum. So it's gonna have a ring, but it's just not gonna hang around as much as it would if it didn't have the holes in it. And I think, again, that's really great because as soon as we start adding mass to this head, we're gonna change how it sounds. You know, the, the tuning is gonna be different because there's like an extra mass on one bit of the head. Even if you distribute it around, it's not quite the same thing as just having like this perfect set of kind of air holes in the, in the head. And that means that we get a very natural sounding snare, but it's just got a shorter sustain. And there's a microphone which I got turned on to by uh, Pete Miles, who's the owner of Middle Farm Studio, a studio I've used a lot and very much, you know, part of my, my uh, drum recording story. It's one of the places I've recorded most. And he discovered that the, the Neumann KMS-105, which is supposed to be a handheld vocal condenser designed for live use, I guess, it's hypercardioid, sounds amazing on a snare drum. And for many reasons, the way it captures the drum sounds amazing. <laughs> Although it's a condenser, which sometimes can sound very flat and neutral in a way that's not very flattering. This one, I think because they were trying to make it useful for vocals, I think they gave it a bit of a presence bump or maybe the grill gives it that. And then it doesn't have as much low end. I think they've got a high pass filter. Um, you know, it still goes deeper than a, than a 57 does or something like that. But yeah, the bleed is very, very low. Okay. It's very highly focused on the drum. The way it captures the transients is very flattering in the mid range. It sounds natural but not boring like it kind of really gives a nice kind of mid-range instead of like a dynamic which tends to raw have kind of a clonk yeah like clonk. kind of 1k oh, yeah. kind yeah. of thing this seems to be focused more down in like the it's probably more like kind of four or five hundred which actually there's a lot of great musical information in the snare drum there 
And having that in the transient helps, I find, get a natural snare sound. So, and any recordings I do with that mic, people have loved the sound okay. of, of the snare drum. I see a 57 as well. For the purposes of this session, I wanted to show, you know, what a 57 sounds like, because that's the sound that people know so much yeah, right. on drums. As a reference. Exactly, yeah. Position-wise on the snare top. Oh yeah, please. Yeah. Nothing fancy. It's like, I don't know, a couple of finger widths up from the rim of the drum, pretty much just over the lip. 45 degrees or something, like yeah. pointing at the middle of the... Pointing at the middle, yeah. yeah. I know you've done good videos, like really good videos on, on how the, the angle of the mic and the proximity affects things. I like to change it up from session to session. Sometimes with the dynamic, it, it can be cool to come in a bit lower and more horizontally across the drum, which gives you like a more, a, a, you lose a bit of the ring and you mm -hmm. get a bit more kind of a beefy, meaty yeah. sound, a little bit less top end, um, but, you just can't go wrong with that. That angle, like a couple of finger widths above the drum, over the brim, just about. Facing the middle. Facing the middle, it's gonna be a great snare top sound. Yeah. And the Neumann, especially because of just the way it's got more low end and stuff, you don't need the proximity effect that with a 57, sometimes it can be nice to get really close on. To the head, yeah. So that's good. And then with the Neve EQs, we can also boost lots of low end into those mics on the way in, and that's gonna make them sound really beefy and have a bit of that proximity effect as well. Let's let's start with the SM57 because that's the one that's got the kind of well, I mean that's such a standard industry standard microphone for for a snare top. The other microphone, the Neumanns, doesn't need as much enhancement. So we'll look at the SM57 first. So let's break that down. Let's try the top band. Remember, this is boosting like 5k and up, but also cutting some some kind of mid range out as well. Now sounding really good, but we're lacking a little bit of body. Let's try 110 hertz, like I said. And it's not just a frequency thing, it's making the pop of the snare really enhanced. Like it's got that lovely plosive character I always talk about. That alone is probably enough, but it can be nice to add just a little bit of 3K again. a little bit. The other frequencies can work pretty well too. We could try going to 4.8. I don't love that. I tend not to use that. Some people I know like the 1.6, which makes it sound more kind of clacky, which is cool, but I'm more of a 3.2 guy on the way in. And basically, if the top end feels like it's getting too bright, boost more low end. <laughs> Do like the opposite things, because this is all boosting EQ, and you can get to a really nice kind of sculpted snare top sound with that. So again, out. And in. Instant rock snare. So. What we're gonna do is record a groove with that one. Time to draw some conclusions. I'm kind of deliberately do the, doing this in quite a real world kind of quick paced way. And you're still gonna get a sense for the sound of the different drums. And then hopefully if there's one that we really like, we can try pushing it around in some different tunings and stuff like that and see what's gonna work. So if we start with uh, Jake's drum, the, the Tempesta snare, so. And that's quite an interesting difference. It's also got less ring. And now that is a slightly different head. That's an HD dry versus an ST dry. And the HD has got an extra kind of um, O-ring around the outside to dry it up. So that might be explaining that. Let's check out maybe more of the, the playing on the uh, kind of groove portion of what Jake played. I 
I'd say for me, there's a clear winner for my taste, and it's actually the John Tempesta here. So I think that Tama snare, it's just a bit beefier sounding, which I really like when he's playing a bit slower and digging in a little bit more, where in the other ones, while they sound nice and neat on the kind of thrashy drumming, they don't have as much of a kind of liveliness to fill the space when he's playing slower. And the tune that we're about to record has both quite open kind of ringing sections and also some really fast stuff. And I think the, the first snare, the Tama, is actually going to be the, the best one that, to cover all of those bases. I've chosen to use the Neumann KMS-105 only for this. Um, I've completely brought the SM57 out of the mix. I'm treating the snare top, the, the Neumann mic, to this Saturn thing, the bleed reduction, basically. So crossover about 1K, pull that dynamic knob almost all the way back, and that's going to reduce the amount of snare bleed quite significantly. So this is what it sounds like without. So it is dulling the sustain in the drum a fair bit. The attack's still got a nice spurt of high end to it, but we need something to fill in the high end content of the sound for the rest of the, the sound of the drum. And that's where the snare bottom comes in. Let's check out what the two together sound like. And this is a crucial part of the mix, is getting the blend of the two right. And I'm often shocked at how low the fader on the snare bottom needs to be before it sounds balanced, because you would almost trick yourself into thinking when the faders are like minus 15 dB that it's not doing anything. But then you mute the snare bottom and it's doing a whole lot. So, um, Let's check out what that sounds like. I'm gonna gradually bring it up from zero, played with the top mic. Yeah, about minus 13 is working for me. That's where I'm gonna keep it for now. Then let's bring up our plugins that we've got on the actual snare bus. First, I've got a gate. Um, this is my kind of go-to settings. It's actually more like an expander because it's going, it's, it's doing like a minus 12 dB cut uh, with a ratio of like 3.5, a little bit of knee as well. And the key here is to make sure that the hard hits are getting completely through the gate. And I actually like the slightly softer hits to be reduced in volume a little bit because I find that once it goes through the next round of compression, through the parallel compression, Sometimes the lower dynamic hits can end up coming out way too loud. So in something like a blast beat, the snare just sounds too loud or ghost notes can be almost as loud as the main hits. Let's check it out without the gate and then I'll, I'll stick it in again. So in addition to gating out the cymbal bleed, it's also reducing the sustain of the drum a little bit, making it sound a bit tighter. So if you had any doubts about that amount of ring on a drum when we tracked it, I think you'll hear now that it's ending up sounding, well, certainly not like a St. Anger snare or anything like that. Then let's look at the EQ, which I've got going on. So big high end boost at about nine and a bit K, fairly wide Q, cutting about 450, that slightly cardboardy area there. You have to be careful. If you, can, if you scoop that out too much, it can kind of, I don't know, make drums sound a bit weirdly scooped, I guess, but just not in a pleasant way. Um, and then I am boosting the low end with this thing, which I like to do, which is a, a steep Q uh, shelf. So that puts in a bit of a resonant peak just below the, the spot where you're, you know, the frequency that you've decided, and then it actually introduces a bit of a, a cut above that frequency as well. Um, so I've got here, it says it's 240, but the reality is that that bump is happening a bit lower, more like just below 200. And I've actually just notched a little bit of the fundamental note of the drum out, um, because with that extra bump, which I'm adding, the, the fundamental tone was over bearing and the combination of boosting a more general area and then just notching that that fundamental out has made that the, it's meant that the actual low punch of the snare sounds really solid now and tight still. So yeah, no EQ first. And then uh, the high-end boost. So this is starting to sound like maybe the snare wires are a bit too loud, but let's see what happens once you put it through compression.
just reducing the snare bottom a little bit as I hear it go through that compression. So with those tweaks, now let's go into clipping. So here I'm just smashing it really hard. Same settings as on the kick. So 16 track, uh, 456 tape, 15 nips, and I'm letting it uh, redline quite a lot here. It's got that kind of effect of spreading the transient and making it all just sound a bit less pokey. It kind of evens out some of the more aggressive aspects of the EQ of the snare drum. Okay, I gotta stop you here. I'm very sorry, I gotta stop you here. But the good news is there's so much more, it's more than, it's almost five hours of content. So if you just enjoyed what you've watched, click the link below and start the Nolly drum experience. Let me just say one more word about the course. Um, you can either get the course or you can get the Cola Audio Cult membership. And the membership does include the Nolly course plus all our other courses. And you can subscribe for either three months or a whole year. It's a subscription-based thingy. And yeah, but from day one, you get everything we've ever released. Courses also from Jens Bogren, from Ermin Hamidovic, from Bob Marlet, from a lot of people and multi-tracks and free IRs and free samples and discounts. And yeah, and you become a cultist, a member of the cult, which means uh, you get access to the community. You can get mix reviews, so you can send in your own mixes. Uh, it's cool. So that's my clear recommendation. Join the cult. Anyway, the Nolly Drum experience I think is a course for everybody. It doesn't really matter if you are starting out or if you are already a seasoned uh, producer. I think everybody will learn something from that vast knowledge that this guy gathered over the years in countless tests and uh, drum recording sessions. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. Enjoy the course. I see you in hell motherfuckers. Bye-bye. Tschüss.